such a journey. YouTube is not working right today. <clears throat> but I guess we're up now, so we'll hope for the best. I was trying to get on here earlier, but I was editing a video. It took me forever, and before I knew it, it was 10 o'clock. <laughs> now we're together. This, we have good news. So we're not going to read today Dolores because Valley of the Dolls came in from a different library. It came from some library in Georgia. So we're going to read this one today only because I have to return it within a couple of weeks. So we don't have much time. We'll get, well, hopefully we'll be able to finish it. It's a quick read, even though it's about 500 pages. And we'll finish with Dolores because that came from my local library and I can spend a lot more time with it. But since this came from a borrowed library, so hey, we'll get right to it. And I'm so excited. Valley of the Dolls is a fabulous story. And this is my shout out is my bubblegum Pepto-Bismol pink lipstick. And it smells like bubblegum. Isn't that crazy? And then the bottom part is lip gloss. And that smells like bubble gum too. It smells like you can just eat it. I bought it at the Dollar Tree for a dollar twenty-five. And in honor of the dolls, we're gonna give my product placement is some pills, which I have to say, my disclaimer is you always want to check with your physician before you ever take any kind of a doll or a pill. But these are just some generic ibuprofens. But in, in honor of the Valley of the Dolls, because dolls is a metaphor for pills or drugs. And just a quick update on my plant. Look, it's starting to bloom. And I don't know why, because I have no green thumb whatsoever. Not at all. I don't, it doesn't have a fragrance. I, I don't really keep things alive very long. I'm just not a cook or a plant person. I want to be, but I'm not. I'm so happy to see you. Very good to see you all. So we're going to just dive right in because like I said, we don't have a whole lot of time to read this because it came from a, a foreign library in Georgia and we have to read it pretty quickly because I have to return it. And I don't know if I'm going to be granted any type of um, renewal like you can do with other books. So um, we will read just a little. This first one says, Jacqueline Suzanne's Valley of the Dolls reveals more about the drug-filled, love-starred, sex-satiated nightmare world of show business than any other book published. <laughs> show business, a world where sex is a success weapon, where love is a smiling mask for hate and envy where the past is obscured and the future is oblivion in this sick world where age and fading beauty are twin specters. The tickets to peace are dolls, the insider's word for pills, pep, pep pills, sleeping pills, red pills, blue pills, up pills, down pills, pills the chase, the truth away. And this book was made into a movie in the 1960s, I guess, or early 1970s, and it had Sharon Tate, before, of, uh, of course, she was murdered by the Manson family while she was pregnant. Uh, so that was, the, that was Sharon Tate's claim to fame. Unfortunately, her murder is what put her into the limelight much more than anything else. So this is about the author. Jacqueline Suzanne was born in Philadelphia. Her mother was a school teacher and her father was Robert Susan, the famous portrait painter. At the age of 16, Miss Susan announced that she wanted to be an actress. Before she had a chance to reconsider, her parents bought her a one-way ticket to New York. Wow. She acted in several Broadway shows and appeared frequently on television. In 1963, her book Every Night, Josephine, was published and became an immediate success. It was followed by Valley of the Dolls, The Love Machine, and Once Is Not Enough each a worldwide and world-famous bestseller. Miss Susan is married to television motion picture producer Irving Mansfield. She divides her time between New York City and California. So let's dig right in. This is Valley of the Dolls. 
It's a good read, a good Saturday read. She dedicated this book, and this was published, the very first publishing was in 1966. And she dedicated the book to Josephine, who sat at my feet, positive I was writing a sequel. And then the next page it says, but most of all to Irving. That's her husband. So Valley of the Dogs by Jacqueline Suzanne. You've got to climb to the top of Mount Everest to reach the Valley of the Dolls. It's a brutal climb to reach that peak, which so few have seen. You never knew what was really up there, but the last thing you expected to find was the Valley of the Dolls. You stand there waiting for the rush of exhilaration you thought you'd feel, but it doesn't come. You're too far away to hear the applause and take your bows, and there's no place left to climb. You're alone, and the feeling of loneliness is overpowering. The air is so thin you can scarcely breathe. You've made it, and the world says you're a hero. But it was more fun at the bottom when you started, with nothing more than hope and dream of fulfillment. All you saw was the top of that mountain. There was no one to tell you about the Valley of the Dolls. But it's different when you reach the summit. The elements have left you battered, defended, sightless, and too weary to enjoy your victory. Anne Wells had never meant to start the climb, yet unwillingly she took her first step. The day she looked around and said to herself, this is not enough. I want more. I want something more. And when she met Lion Burke, it was too late to turn back. This chapter is titled Anne. September 1945. The temperature hit 90 degrees the day she arrived. New York was steaming, an angry concrete animal caught unawares in an unseasonable hot spell. But she didn't mind the heat or the littered midway called Times Square. She thought New York was the most exciting city in the world. The girl at the employment agency smiled and said, ah, you're, you're a cinch. Even with no experience, <clears throat> all the good secretaries are away in those big paying defense jobs. But honest, honey, if I had your looks, I'd head straight for John Powers or Con Conover. Who are they, Anne asked. They run the top modeling agencies in town. That's what I'd love to do, only I'm too short and not skinny enough. But you're just what they're looking for. I think I'd rather work in an office, Anne said. Okay, but I think you're crazy. She handed Anne several slips of paper. Here, they're all good leads, but go to Henry Bellamy first. He's a big theatrical attorney. His secretary just met, married John Walsh. When Anne failed to react, the girl said, Now don't tell me you never heard of John Walsh. He's won three Oscars, and I just read he's going to get Garbo out of retirement and direct her comeback picture. Anne smiled assured the girl she would never forget John Walsh. Now you get the idea of the setup of the kind of people you'll meet. The girl went on. Bellamy and Bellows, a real great office. They handle all kinds of big clients. Ann Myrna, the girl who married John Walsh, she couldn't touch you in the looks department. You'll grab a live one right away. A live what? Guy. Maybe even a husband. The girl looked back at Ann's application. Say, where did you say you're from? It is in America, isn't it? Anne smiled. Lawrenceville. It's at the start of the Cape, about an hour from Boston by train. And if I had wanted a husband, I could have stayed right there. In Lawrenceville, everyone gets married as soon as they get out of school. I'd like to work a while first. And you left such a place? Here, everyone is looking for a husband, including me. Maybe you could send me to this Lawrenceville with a letter of introduction. You mean you'd marry just anyone? Anne was curious. Not anyone, just anyone who'd give me a nice beaver coat, a part-time maid, and let me sleep till noon each day. The fellows I know not only expect me to keep my job, but at the same time I should look like Carolyn Landis in a negligee while I whip up a few gourmet dishes. When Anne laughed, the girl said, all right, you'll see. Wait till you get involved with some of the Romeos in this town. I bet you rush for the fastest train back to Lawrenceville. And on the way, don't forget to stop by and take me with you. 
She would never go back to Lawrenceville. She had just left Lawrenceville. She had escaped, escaped from marriage to some solid Lawrenceville boy from the solid orderly, ordinary, orderly life of Lawrenceville, the same orderly life her mother had lived and her mother's mother and the same orderly kind of a house, a house that a good New England family had lived in generation after generation, its inhabitants smothered with the orderly, unused emotions, emotions that stifled beneath the creaky iron armor called nanners. And a lady never laughs out loud, and a lady never sheds tears in public, but this isn't public. I'm crying to you, Mama, here in the kitchen, but a lady sheds tears in privacy. You're not a child, Anne. You're 12, and Aunt Amy is here in the kitchen. Now go to your room. And somehow Lawrenceville had pursued her to Radcliffe. Oh, there were girls who laughed and shed tears and gossiped and enjoyed the highs and lows of life, but they never invited her into the world. It was as if she wore a large sign that said, stay away, cold, reserved, New England type. More and more she retreated into books and even there she found a pattern repeated. It seemed that virtually every writer she encountered had fled to the city of his birth. Hemingway alternated between Europe, Cuba, and Bimini. Poor, bewildered, talented Fitzgerald had also lived abroad, and even the red, lumpy-looking Sinclair Lewis had found romance and excitement in Europe. She would escape from Lawrenceville. It was as simple as that. She made the decision in her senior year of college and announced it to her mother and Aunt Amy during her Easter vacation. Mama, Aunt Amy, when I finish college, I'm going to New York. That's a dreadful place for a vacation. I intended to live there. Have you discussed this with Willie Henderson? No, why should I? Well, you've kept company since you both were 16. Everybody naturally assumes. That's just it. In Lawrenceville, everything is assumed. And you are raising your voice, her mother said calmly. Willie Henderson is a fine boy. I went to school with his daddy and his mother. But I don't love him, Mama. No man can be loved. This from Aunt Amy. Did you love Daddy, Mama? It wasn't a question. It was almost an accusation. Of course I loved him, her mother's voice bristled. But what Aunt Amy means is, well, men are different. They don't think or react like women. Now take your father. He was an extro extremely difficult man to understand. He was impulsive and he enjoyed his drink. If he had been married to anyone but me, he might have had a bad, had a bad end. I never saw daddy drink, Anne said defensively. Of course not. There was prohibition and I never kept a drop in the house. I broke him of the habit before it could take hold. Oh, he had a lot of wild ways in the beginning. His grandmother was French, you know. Latins are always a little crazy, Aunt Amy agreed. There was nothing crazy about Daddy. Suddenly, Anne wished she had known him better. It seemed so long ago, the day he reeled forward right here in the kitchen. She had been 12. He never said a word, just slumped quietly to the floor and quietly died before the doctor even reached the house. You're right, Anne. There was nothing crazy about your father. He was a man, but he was a good man. Don't forget, Amy. His mother was a banister. Ellie Bannister went all through school with our mama. But mama, didn't you ever really love daddy? I mean, when a man you love takes you in his arms and kisses you, it should be wonderful, shouldn't it? Wasn't it ever wonderful with daddy? Anne, how dare you ask your mother such a thing, said Aunt Amy. Unfortunately, kissing isn't all a man expects after marriage, her mother said stiffly, then cautiously. Have you ever kissed Willie Henderson? Anne grimaced. Yeah, a few times. And did you enjoy it? Her mother asked. I hated it. His lips had been soft, almost slimy, and his breath smelled sour. Did you ever kiss any other boy? Anne shrugged it. Oh, a few years back when Willie and I first started dating at parties. We'd play spin the bottle. I guess I got around to kissing most of the boys in town, and as I recall, each kiss was as repulsive as another. She smiled. Mother, I don't think we have one decent kisser in all of Lawrenceville. Her mother's good humor returned. You're a lady, Anne. That's why you don't like kissing. No lady does. 
Oh, Mama, I don't know what I like or what I am. That's why I want to go to New York. Her mother shrugged. Anne, you have $5,000. Your father left that specifically for you to use as you wished. When I go, there will be a good deal more. We're not rich like the Hendersons, but we're comfortable, and our family stands for something in Lawrenceville. I want to feel that you'll come back and settle in this house. My mother was born here. Of course, Willie Henderson may want to add a wing. There's plenty of ground, but at least it will be our house. I don't love Willie Henderson, Mama. There is no such thing as love, the way you talk about it. You'll only find that kind of love in cheap movies and novels. Love is companionship, having friends in common, the same interest. Sex is a connotation you're placing on love. And let me tell you, young lady, that if and when it does exist, it dies very quickly after marriage or as soon as the girl learns what it's all about. But go to your New York. I won't stand in your way. I'm sure Willie will wait. But mark my words, Anne, after a few weeks you'll come running home. You'll be glad to leave that dirty city. It had been dirty and hot and crowded the day she arrived. Sailors and soldiers joggled along Broadway with a reckless holiday spirit in their eager stares and a convulsive end of the war excitement. But mingled with dirt and humidity and strangeness, Anne had felt excitement and an awareness of living. The littered and cracked pavements of New York made the trees and clear air of New York seemed cold and lifeless. The unshaven man who removed the room for let a sign from the window after accepting a week's rent in advance looked like Mr. Kingston, the mailman back home, but his smile had been warmer. It's not much of a room, he'd admitted, but the ceiling is high and it kind of stirs the air. And I'm always around to fix anything you want. She felt, she felt he liked her and she liked him. There was an acceptance at his face value in New York, as if everyone had just been born with no past heritage to acknowledge or hide. And now as she stood before the imposing glass doors engraved Bellamy and Bellows, she hoped she'd find the same kind of acceptance from Henry Bellamy. Henry Bellamy couldn't believe his eyes. She couldn't be for real. In her way, maybe she was one of the most beautiful girls he had ever seen, and he was accustomed to beautiful girls. And instead of wearing an outrageous pompadour and platform shoes that had come into style, this one just let her hair hang loose, natural, and it was the light blonde color that looked real. But it was her eyes that really rattled him. They were really blue, sky blue, but glacial. Why do you want this job, Miss Wells? For some reason, he felt nervous. Damn it, he was curious. She was dressed in plain dark linen, and there wasn't a sign of jewelry except the small, neat wristwatch. But there was something about her that made one certain she didn't need a job. I want to live in New York, Mr. Bellamy. Just that? A straight answer? Why did, did it make him feel like he was snooping? He was entitled to ask questions, and if he made, to, made it too easy, she might not take the job. That was crazy, too. She was sitting here, wasn't she? She hadn't just dropped by for tea. And why did he feel as if he were the applicant striving to make a favorable impression on her? He glanced at the form the agency had sent along. Twenty years old and a BA in English, uh, Radcliffe? But no office experience. Now tell me, what good is this fancy background going to do around here? Can it help me handle a bitch like Helen Lawson? Or get a drunken bum like Bob Wolf to turn in a weekly radio script on time? or convince some fag singer to leave Johnson Harris' office and let me handle his affairs? Am I supposed to do all that, she asked? No, I am, but you have to help. But I thought you were an attorney. He saw her collect her gloves. He turned on one of his relaxed smiles. I'm a theatrical attorney. There's a difference. I draw up contracts for my clients, contracts that have no loopholes, except in their favor. I also handle their taxes, help them invest their money, get them out of any and all trouble, arbitrate their marital problems, keep their wives and mistresses apart, <laughs> act as godfather to their children and wet nurse to them, especially when they're doing a new show. But I thought actors and writers had managers and agents. They do, he noticed the gloves were back in her lap. But the jumbos, the kind I handle, they also need me to advise them, for instance, an agent natu naturally pushes them toward the job 
that pays the most. He's interested in his 10%, but I figure which job will do them the most good. In short, a theatrical attorney has to be a combination of agent, mother, and God. And you, if you get the job, have to be their patron saint. Anne smiled. Why don't theatrical attorneys replace all agents? They probably would if there were enough dedicated schmucks like me. He caught himself quickly. Excuse the language. When I get going, I don't realize what pops out. What language, schmuck? Uh, she repeated it curiously. It sounded so outrageous coming from her that he laughed out loud. It's a Jewish word, and the literal translation would make you blush, but it's become slang for dope. Oh, don't let the fancy tag of Bellamy fool you, or even my freak Episcopalian face. I was born in Birnbaum. When I was a kid, I worked summers as an entertainment director on cruises, wrote the ship's column, and they don't like their fancy columns headed boating by Birnbaum. So one guy suggested Bellamy. I met a lot of important people on those cruises. A singer who was working the tour became my first client. A lot of people got to know me as Bellamy, and I stuck with it, but I never let anyone forget that under the Bellamy, there's always burn bomb. He smiled. Now you have the whole picture. Think you can handle it? This time her smile was real. I'd like to try. I type fairly well, but I don't know much about shorthand. He waved his hand. I got two broads out there who could win shorthand contests. I want someone who's more than a secretary. He, <laughs> her smile vanished. I don't think I understand. Damn it, he hadn't meant anything like that. He ground his cigarette in the tray and lit another one. Jesus, she sat straight. Unconsciously, he straightened in his chair. Well, look, Miss Wells, being more than a secretary means not sticking to the usual nine to five routine. There may be days when you won't have to come in until noon. And if I've made you work at night, I wouldn't expect you to come in. But on the other hand, if there was some crisis, and even if you had worked until four in the morning, I'd expect you in before the office opened, because you would want to be there. In other words, you make your own schedule, but you'd also have to be available some evenings. He paused a second, but she did not react. So he hurried on, say, I was having dinner at 21 with a prospective client. If I go for the right dinner and make with the right words, it's a pretty good bet he'll sign with me. But I may have to have six or seven drinks with him and listen to his gripes about his present management. Naturally, I'll swear on my life not to do any of these things. I'll promise him everything, the moon with his name on it. Now I can't give him all those things I promised. No one could. But I will make one honest effort to avoid the mistakes of his present management and keep what promises I can. Only the next morning I won't remember a word. That's where you come in. You won't have a hangover because during the thrilling evening you will have sipped one sherry and you will remember everything I said. The following day you will present me with a list of all the promises and I can study them when my head is clear. She smiled. I'd be sort of a human dictaphone. <laughs> exactly. You could handle it. Well, I have an excellent memory and I hate sherry. This time they laughed together. Okay, Anne, want to start tomorrow? She nodded. Will I also work with Mr. Bellows? He gazed into space and said quietly, there's no Mr. Bellows. Oh, there's George, his nephew, but George is not the Bellows and Bellamy and Bellows. That was George's uncle, Jim Bellows. I bought Jim out before he went to war. I tried to talk him out of it, but no, he went to Washington and got carried away with that Navy uniform and in a commission. He saw the war was for the young. Jim Bellows was 53, too old for war, but too young to die. He was killed in Europe or the Pacific. He died of a heart attack in a submarine, the damn fool. But the gun gruffness in his voice only punctuated the affection he felt for the dead man. Then, with an abrupt change of mood, he flashed one of his warm smiles. Okay, and I guess we're exchanged enough of our life stories. I can start you at 75 a week. How does that set with you? It was more than she'd expected. Her room cost 18, uh, food about 15. She told him she could manage quite well. October 1945. September had been a good month. She found a job. She liked a girlfriend named Neely and a gentle, eager escort named Alan Cooper. 
She had been welcomed with instant acceptance by the receptionist and two secretaries. She lunched with them each day at the corner drugstore. Leanne Burke was their favorite topic, and Miss Steinberg, the senior secretary, was the expert. She had been with Hen Henry Bellamy 10 years. She had known Leanne Burke. Leanne had been with the office two years and when the war was declared, and he left to enlist the day after Pearl Harbor. Jim Bellows had often suggested that his nephew join the firm. Henry had nothing against George Bellows, but he had always refused. Business and relatives don't mix. He had insisted, but with Lyon, Lyon gone, Henry was left with little choice. There was nothing wrong with George. He was a capable lawyer, but he lacked the chemistry of Leon Burke, and at least in Miss Steinberg's eyes, Leon's activities in the war had been avidly followed by all of the staff, and when he had received his captain's bars, Henry had taken off half the day to celebrate. The last year had come from London in August. Leon was alive. Leon sent regards, but Leon said nothing about returning. At first, Henry had watched the mail each day. When September passed without a word, he moodily re reconciled himself to Leon's permanent withdrawal from the firm. But Miss Steinberg refused to give up, and Miss Steinberg was right. The wire came in October. It was directed and to the point. It was direct and to the point. Dear Henry, well, it's over, and I'm still in one piece. Visited some relatives in London and stopped off at Brighton for some sea and rest. Am in Washington waiting for my official release. As soon as they let me trade in their uniform for my old blue suit, I shall return. Best, Leon. Henry Bellamy's face lit up when he read the wire. He jumped from his chair. Leon's coming back. Leon, I knew he would. For the next 10 days, the office was in a turmoil of interior decorators, excitement, and speculative gossip. I can't wait, the receptionist sighed. He sounds just like my type. Miss Steinberg's smile was loaded with secret knowledge. He's everybody's type, honey. If, if his looks don't polish you off, the English accent does the rest. He's English and was surprised. Born here, Miss Steinberg explained. His mother was now Leanne. That was way before your time. Mine too. She was a big English musical comedy star. She came here in a show and married an American lawyer, Tom Burke. She retired and Leanne was born here. So that makes him an American citizen, but his mother held on to her British citizen citizenship. And when Leanne's father died, I think Leanne was about five, she took him back to London. She went back on the stage, and he went to school there. When she died, he came back and went to law school here. I know I'll fall madly in love with him, the younger secretary said. Miss Steinberg shrugged. Every girl in the office had a crush on him. But I can't wait to see his reaction when he meets you, Anne. Me? Anne looked startled. Yes, you. You both have the same quality. A standoffishness, only Leon keeps blinding you with that smile and it fools you at first. You think he's friendly, but you can never get really close to him. No one could, not even Mr. Bellamy. Deep down, Mr. B's a little in awe of Leon and not just because of his looks or manner. Leon delivers. You watch. Leon Burke will own this town one day. I've seen Mr. B pull some pretty brilliant deals, but he has to fight every inch of the way because everyone knows he's smart and they're prepared for him. Leon just walks in with the English charm and the movie star looks and wham, he comes off with everything he wants. But after a while, you realize you don't know what he really is like and what he thinks of you or of anyone. What I mean is it seems to like everyone equally. So you get the feeling that maybe deep down he doesn't really care about anyone or anything except his work. For that, he'll do anything, but whatever you think about him, you still wind up adoring him. The second wire arrived 10 days later on a Friday morning. Dear Henry, have blue suit, arrive in New York tomorrow night, will come directly to your flat, see if you can book hotel reservation, expect to start Monday, best, Leon. Henry Bellamy took off at noon to celebrate. Anne was just finishing the mail when George Bellows stopped at her desk. Why don't we go somewhere and celebrate too, he asked casually. She couldn't hide her astonishment. Her association with George Bellows had been confined to an official good morning and an occasional nod. I'm asking you to lunch, he explained. I'm very sorry, but I promised to join the girls at the drugstore. 
He helped her into her coat. Too bad, he said. This may be our last day on earth. He smiled ruefully and drifted back to his office. At lunch, she listened to endless chatter about Leanne Burke with half a mind, wondering idly why she had turned down George's invitation. Fear of complications from one lunch? How silly. Loyalty to Alan Cooper? Well, Alan was the only man she knew in New York, and he was very kind. Perhaps that did rate him a kind of loyalty. She recalled the day he had burst into the office, determined to clinch some kind of deal insurance. Anne later found out. Henry had been unusually cold and had gotten rid of him quickly, so quickly, in fact, that Anne's sympathy were aroused. As she let him out, she had whispered, Better luck next stop. He had seemed almost startled at the warm in her, warmth in her voice. Two hours later, her phone rang. This is Alan Cooper. Do you remember me? The dynamic salesman? Well, I want you to know that my session with Henry was a wild success to compare to my other stops, at least at Bellamy's. I met you. You mean you haven't made a sale? She felt genuinely sorry. Nope, struck out everywhere. Guess this just isn't my day unless you want to give it a happy ending by having a drink with me. I don't. Drink? Me either? So let's make it dinner then. That's how it began and continued. He was pleasant and had a nice sense of humor. She thought of him as a friend rather than a date. Very often she didn't bother to change her clothes after work. He never seemed to notice that she, what she wore, and he always seemed eagerly grateful for her company. They went to little unknown restaurants, and she always selected the least expensive item on the menu. She wanted to offer to pay her in, but she was afraid it might make him feel more, more of a failure. Alan was hopelessly miscast as a salesman. He was too nice and mild-mannered for his profession. He asked questions about Lawrenceville, her days at school, and even events at the office. He made her feel like the most interesting, fascinating girl in the world. She continued to see him because he made no demands upon her. Sometimes in a movie he held her hand, he made no attempt to kiss her goodnight. Her feeling was one of relief mixed with curious sense of inadequacy. It was almost embarrassing not to be able to arouse any passion in poor Alan, but she was content to let manner, matters rest. The thought of kissing him brought on the same distaste she had experienced when she kissed Willie Henderson back in Lawrenceville, and this made her wonder again about her own capacity for love. Perhaps she wasn't normal, or maybe her mother was right. Maybe passion and romance didn't exist only in fiction. Later that afternoon, George Bellows stopped at her desk again. I've come to make another pitch, he said. How about the 16th of January? You can't be dated up that far ahead, but that's almost three months away. Oh, I'll be glad to take anything that opens before then, but Helen Lawson just called screaming for Henry, and it reminded me that her show opens on the 16th. That's right. Hit the sky. Goes into rehearsal next week. Well, will you, or won't you, go with me? I love it, George. I think Helen Lawson is wonderful. She used to break in all her shows in Boston. When I was a little girl, my father took me to see her Madame Pompadour. Okay, it's a date. Oh, and Anne, once this show goes into rehearsal, Helen is liable to come crashing in here a good deal. If you two ever get around to the small talk department, don't come up with that I loved you when I was a little girl routine. She might stab you. <laughs> but I was a little girl, and ridiculous as it sounds, that was only 10 years ago. But even then, Helen Lawson was a mature woman. She was at least 35. Around here, we act like she's 28. George, you can't be serious. Why, Helen Lawson is ageless. She's a great star. It's her personality and talent that make her so attractive. I'm sure she's too intelligent to think she looks like a girl. <clears throat> George shrugged. Tell you what, I'll phone you 20 years from now and ask you how you feel. Looking 28 seems to be an infect infectious disease that most men catch the moment they hit 40. To play it safe, just don't bring up the subject of age around Helen, and please mark your calendar January 16th. In the meantime, have a ni ni nice weekend and take it easy. I'll be plenty hectic around here on Monday when the conquering hero comes marching home. The receptionist was wearing a tight new plaid. The junior secretary's pompadour was two inches higher. Even Miss Steinberg had broken out the last spring's navy suit. Anne set her cubby hole outside Henry's office and tried to concentrate on the mail, but like the others, her attention was riveted on the door. 
He arrived at 11 o'clock with the, all the office gossip and speculation. She was still unprepared for anyone as striking as Liam Burke. Henry Bellamy was a tall man, but Liam Burke towered over him by a good three inches. His hair was Indian black, and his skin seemed so burned into a permanent tan. Henry bristled with unconcealed pride as he led Leanne around and performed introductions. The receptionist colored visibly when she took his hand. The junior secretary simpered, and Miss Steinberg went absolutely kittenish in her excitement. For the first time, Anne was grateful for her rigid New England reserve. She knew she presented a calm... She knew uh, she didn't feel as Liam Burke took her hand. Henry hasn't stopped talking about you now that we meet. It's quite, it's quite easy to understand. The English accent was definitely an asset. Anne managed a gracious answer and was grateful when Henry Bellamy steered Leanne toward the newly decorated office. And you come in with us, Henry ordered. It's overwhelming, Leanne said, makes one bit of apprehensive of the work expected in return. He eased into a chair and smiled lazily. Anne suddenly understood what Miss Steinberg meant. Leanne Burke did smile at everyone, and that easy smile was impenetrable. Henry beamed paternally. Just be the same lazy bum you were before you left, and I'll redecorate for you every year. Now let's get down to cases. Anne Leon needs in an apartment. He's staying with me until he gets set, Henry explained. Would you believe it? We couldn't get him a hotel room. She believed it, she, but she wondered why it should concern her. I want you to find him a place, said Henry. You want me to find Mr. Burke an apartment? Sure, you can do it, Henry said. That's part of being more than a secretary. This time, Leon laughed heartily. She's a beauty, Henry. She's everything you said, but she isn't Houdini, he winked at Anne. Henry led a very sheltered life. He hasn't looked for a flat in New York lately. Henry shook his head. Listen, the girl arrived there two months ago, and she didn't know 7th Avenue from Broadway. She not only found an apartment the first day, but landed this job and has, met, has me eating out of her hand. Well, mine isn't really an apartment. It's very small. He, his direct gaze unsettling, my dear Anne, after some of those bombed-out places I slept in during the war, anything with a ceiling looks like the Ritz. Anne will come up with something, Henry insisted. Try for the east side, living room, bedroom, bath, and kitchen. Furnished around 150 a month. Go to 175 if you have to. Start in right away this afternoon. Take tomorrow off. Take as long as you need. But don't come back until you have the apartment. Henry, we will never see this girl again, Leanne Warren. My money's on Anne. She'll come up with something. Her room was on the second floor of the brownstone. Today, the two flights suddenly seemed insurmountable. She stood at the landing, holding the battered New York Times. She had spent the afternoon visiting every apartment listed, and they had all been taken. Her feet ached. She dressed that morning for the office, not for apartment hunting. Tomorrow, she'll get an early start in flat heels. Before she tackled the stairs, she knocked at Neely's door. There was no answer. She plodded up the shaky stairs and let herself into her room. She was grateful to hear the steam hissing through the ancient radiator. Regardless of Liam Burke, I'll take anything attitude. She couldn't quite visualize him in a room like this. Not that it was a bad room. It was clean and conveniently located. Of course, compared to her spacious bedroom in Lawrenceville, it was an awful room. The lumpy studio bed looked as if it might not last another year. Sometimes she wondered how many people had slept on it, hundreds perhaps, but she didn't know them, and perhaps it was just this anonymity that made her made it her bed. As long as she paid her rent, everything in this room belonged to her. The small batter night table crisscrossed with scratches and old cigarette burns, the bureau with three drawers that had to be left slightly open because they stuck if they were closed, and if you pulled too hard, the knobs came off and the pregnant easy chair. It lowered its lowered belly bulging with springs that just longed to burst through. It could be made attractive, but there was never enough money left at the end of the week. She was determined not to touch the 5,000 she had in the bank. She was still paying off her Bloomingdale bill for the good black dress and the good black evening coat. She heard the familiar knock and called, I'm in, without looking up. Neely entered and flopped in the chair, which groaned and came perilously close to disemboweling itself. 
What's with the ads in the Times, thinking of moving? When Anne explained her new assignment, Ely laughed out loud. You mean he doesn't want a terror thrown in along with about four, four walk-in closets? Then dismissing the incident as impossible and thereby closed, she turned to the important matter. Anne, did you get a chance to talk about it today? It was a favor Neely had been hammering at for four weeks. For two weeks. Neely, how could I today of all days with Lee and Burke coming back? But we've got to get in to hit the sky. For some crazy re reason, Helen Lawson seems to like our act. We've been called back to audition three times since she was there at all our auditions. Now just one word from Henry Bellamy would cinch it. We met Neely and her two partners. Neely's formal name was Ethel Agnes O'Neill. Isn't that a pistol? She had exclaimed, but the nickname of Neely had stuck since childhood. And since she was one third of a dance team called the Guacheros, there was no need to do anything about the unwieldy names. Anne's acquaintance with Neely had begun with a casual nod in the hall and had rapidly moved into a warm friendship. Neely looked like a gurgling, exuberant teenager. She had a snub nose, large brown eyes, freckles, and curly brown hair. And in fact, Neely was a teenager, a teenager who had toured, toured in vaudeville since she was seven. It was hard to think of Neely as a performer, but one night she had dragged Anne along to a club date at a midtown hotel, and there a strange transformation had taken place. The freckles vanished under her thick coat of grease paint, and the childish figure matured with the help of a sleazy sequin dress. It was a passable pedestrian kind of act, two men in frayed sombrero hats and tight pants, gyrating with the inevitable foot stamping and finger clicking designed to pass for Spanish dancing. Anne had seen similar acts in Volville back home, but she'd never seen anyone like Neely. She wasn't sure whether Neely was exceptionally good or outrageously bad. She never actually became a part of the Gracheros. She danced in time with them, spun with them, and bowed with them, but it wasn't a trio. She, you watched only Neely, but without the costume and makeup sitting on the sagging chair, Neely was just an eager 17-year-old girl, the first real friend, had ever, uh, friend Anne ever had known. I wish I could help you, Neely, but I can't go to Mr. Bellamy with a personal matter. Our relationship is strictly business. So what? Everyone in town knows he was Helen Lawson's lawyer way back and that she still listens to everything he says. He was what? Her lover, her guy. Don't tell me you didn't know. Neely, where did you hear a silly thing like that? Silly, geez, you mean nobody told you about it? It was a long time ago and she, was, she had three husbands since then, but they were the hottest item around for years. Why do you think I've been on your neck about talking to Bellamy? Can you mention it to him tomorrow? I'll be apartment hunting tomorrow and Neely, I've told you, it just isn't right bringing your personal life into the office. Neely sighed. Those fancy matters are going to stand in your way, Anne. you got to go in a direct line for the thing you want. Come right out and ask for it. Neely happened, and what happens if you get turned down? Neely shrugged. So what? You're no worse off than you were if you hadn't asked. At least this way you give yourself a 50-50 chance. Anne smiled at Neely's logic. Neely had no education, but she had the inborn intelligence of a mongrel puppy, plus the added sparkle that causes one puppy to stand out in a litter. This puppy was clumsy, frank, and eager, with a streak of unexpected worldliness running through her innocence. Neely had spent the first seven years of her life in foster homes. Then her sister, who was 10 years older, met Charlie, one of the Guacheros, and married him. They turned the act into a trio, and she immediately rescued Neely from the monotony of a foster home and formal schooling and introduced her to the life of a traveling third-rate vaudeville troupe. That was the end of school, but there was always someone on the bill who took a hand in helping Neely with her reading and arithmetic. She learned geography through train windows and picked up history from the European acts who played on the bill. And there was always a friendly doorman who sent in the alarm when an investigator from the Board of Education came around to check. When Neely was 14, her sister retired to have a baby. 
and Neely, who knew the act backwards, replaced her. And now, after all the small time years, the Guacheras had a chance at a Broadway show. Maybe I can bring it up with George Bellows, Anne said thoughtfully as she freshened her makeup. He invited me to the opening of Hit the Sky. That's the long way around, Neely said, but it's better than nothing. She watched Anne change into a tweed suit. Oh, seeing Alan tonight, Anne nodded. I figured, Mr. Bellamy, it's the black dress. Gosh, doesn't he ever get tired of that same black dress? Mr. Bellamy never notices me when I go out with him. It's business. Ha, huh, Neely snorted. Boy, it sure sounds jazzy working in that office. Show business is a drag in comparison. You got George for an opening coming up, Mr. Bellamy, for those fancy dinners at 21. You even found Alan in the office and now Lee and Burke, GC. And you got four guys and I haven't even got one. And laughed. Mr. Bellamy is not a date. The opening isn't until January. And Lee and Burke, I am nothing more than a rent renting agent. And Alan, well, Alan and I just date. That's still four times the action I got. I've never had a real date. The only men I know are my brother-in-law and his partner, Dickie. And Dickie's fag. <laughs> my big social life is going over to Walgreens drugstore and talking to the out-of-work actors. Haven't you met any actors who could take you out? Huh. You don't know actors if you ask a question like that. Take you out? They don't even lift your tab for a five-cent Coke. It's not that actors are born cheap, but they're out of jobs so much they gotta be. And most of them have jobs at night. They're busboys, elevator operators, desk clerks, anything that'll leave them free to job hunt during the day and see the managers. Do you expect to go on the road soon? Anne suddenly realized how much she would miss Neely. I hope not. My sister says the baby's just beginning to know the father. That's why Charlie's knocking himself out and taking and talking all these club all these club dates. But Dickie's beginning to holler. We can make more money on tour. They want us for a nightclub route in Buffalo, Toronto, and Montreal. That's why we've got to land this spot and hit the sky. Helen Lawson shows are always hits. We'd be able to stay in New York for a whole season, maybe more, then maybe I'll be able to meet a decent guy and get married. Is that what you want to be in? Is that why you want to be in the show? To meet someone and get married? Sure, because then I'd be somebody. I'd be Mrs. Somebody. I'd live in one of those place, live in one place. I'd have friends, people on the block who would know who would know who I was. But what about love? It isn't that easy to find someone you really love. Neely wrinkled her nose. Look, if someone loved me, I'd love him. Gee, Stan, if you only go to Mr. Bellamy, and smile. All right, Neely, I will. The first chance I get. Who knows? You might become the next Pavlova. What's that? She was. Great dancer, Neely laughed. That's for the birds. The star bit, oh, I think I could be a star. Not with this act, but with something funny happens inside of me when I get before an audience, I dance fairly well. But I feel if they applauded loud enough, I could fly. I don't have a really good voice, but I feel if they like me, I could do opera. It's a feeling I get when I'm out there. Like they're all talking, like they're all taking me in their arms or something. I talked to Dick and Charlie about it, but they think I'm crazy. They don't feel a thing. Neely, maybe you should study. Go to acting classes. Maybe you can make it to the top. Neely shook her head. The odds are too tough. I've met too many old timers in the circuit who told me how they almost made it. But you're talking about people who weren't quite good enough, Anne said. Listen, no one sticks in show business because it's got good hours or steady dough. Every kid who goes into it thinks she can make it. But for every Mary Marr, Ethel Merman, and Helen Lawson, there are thousands of bit players who almost made it. Starving in fifth-rate road companies. Anne was silent. She couldn't argue with Neely's logic. She gave her makeup a final pat. All right, Neely, I'll do what I can with Mr. Bellamy, but who knows? Maybe you'll get to the, get the job anyway. They must like your act if they've called you back three times. Neely laughed out loud. That's what I don't get. Why have they called us back? How could Helen Lawson like our cockamamie act? 
unless every other dance team in town is smallpox or something. Listen, if I thought our act was good, I wouldn't be nagging at you. I can't understand why Helen Lawson seems interested unless she's got a lech for Charlie. She's supposed to have eyes for anything and pants, and even though Charlie's not too bright, he is good looking. But what would Charlie do if she did like him? After all, there's your sister. Oh, he'd lay Helen Lawson if he had to, Neely said without emotion. He'd figure he was doing it for my sister in a way. After all, he wouldn't really enjoy banging Helen. She's not exactly a great beauty. Neely, you mean you'd stand still and let that happen? Your sister would never forgive you. And you're not only talk like a virgin. <laughs> but you think like a priest. <laughs> Look, I'm a virgin, but I do know that sex and love are two different things for a man. Charlie used to live in the cheapest room on the road and send my sister three quarters of his paycheck so she and the baby could live nice. But that didn't mean that once in a while he would take a, take a flyer with a nice looking girl on the bill. He just needed sex. It had nothing to do with his love for Kitty and the baby. I've hung on to my virginity because I know men put a high value on it, and I want some man to love me the way Charlie loves Kitty. But it's different with a man. You don't expect him to be a virgin. The buzzer sounded in Anne's room. That meant Alan was at the front door. She pressed the button to signal she was on the way down and grabbed her coat and bag. Come on, Neely, I've got to go. Alan may be holding a cab. Wait. Got one more, more of those terrific chocolate marshmallow cookies left? Neely began poking around in her small closet. Take the whole box, Anne said, holding the door open. Oh, marvelous. Neely followed her, cradling the box. I've got a library copy of Gone with the Wind, a quart of milk, and all these cookies. Wow, what a orgy. <laughs> they went to a little French restaurant. Alan listened attentively as she told him about her new assignment. When she finished, he gulped down the remainder of his coffee and called for the check. And I think the time has come. Time for what? Time for the moment of truth. Time for you to leave Henry Bellamy in a blaze of glory. But I don't want to leave Bellamy. You will. He, his smile was strange, confident. His entire manner had changed. I assume getting Liam Burke an apartment would be a great achievement. You mean you know of one? He nodded, smiling mysteriously as though in a private joke. Outside, he signaled a cab and gave a Sutton Place address. Alan, where are we going? To see Liam Burke's new apartment. At this time of night? Whose apartment is this anyway? You'll see, he said. Just be patient. The rest of the ride was silent. The cab, cab stopped in front of a fashionable building near the East River. The doorman sprang attention. Good evening, Mr. Cooper. The elevator man nodded and automatically stopped at the 10th floor. Alan nonchalantly slipped a key into the door of the apartment. He switched on the lights, revealing a skillfully decorated living room. He pressed another button and soft music drifted through the room. It was a perfect apartment, an apartment made to order for Lee and Bert. Alan, whose apartment is this? Mine. Come, see the rest of the place. The bedroom is quite large. Good closet space. He pulled open sliding doors. Bathroom here, kitchen out there, small, but it has a window. She followed him around without speaking. It was inconceivable. Mild little Alan living here. Now I'll show you the one sour note. He walked into the living room and drew the floor length drapes exposing a neighboring apartment and a window that looked almost near enough to touch. That's the sad story, he said. This dream house is everything but a few. Although I've got to admit that there's a fat guy across the way who fascinates me. He lives alone and in two years I've never seen him touch a drop of food. He lives on beer, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Look. As if, one, as if on cue, a stout man in his undershirt lumbered into the kitchen and opened a bottle of beer. Alan drew the drapes. I used to worry about him in the beginning. I was sure he'd wind up with a vitamin deficiency or something, but he seems to be thriving on it. He led her to the couch. Well, does it fit the bill for Mr. Burke? I think it's wonderful, even with the fat man. But Alan, why would you ever give up such a marvelous apartment? I found a better one. 
I can move in tomorrow, but I want you to see it first. It's important that you like it too. Good Lord, he was going to ask her to marry him. Nice, sweet Alan. She didn't want to hurt him, but maybe she could pretend not to understand. She forced an impersonal airiness into her voice. Alan, just because I've been assigned to find an apartment for Mr. Leonberg doesn't mean I'm an expert. This was just done to expedite things at the office because Liam Burke can't take the time off. If you found this apartment on your own, you certainly don't need any advice from me. She knew she was talking too fast. You say he can pay 150, Alan said, but he could go to 175. Tell you what, we'll give it to him for 150. That should make a real hero out of you. He can take over my lease. That's what I pay unfurnished, but I'll throw in the furniture as a bonus. She was suddenly concerned, but you'll need it in your new place, she protested. Besides, it must have cost a lot. It doesn't matter, he said gaily. Can Leon Burke move in here right away? Well, I guess. Sure he can, Alan said. Come on, I'll show you my new place. He hustled her out and down to the elevator, ignoring her protestations about the late hour. On the, on the street again, the attentive doorman charged over. Taxi, Mr. Cooper? No, Joe, we're just going down the street. He led her down the block and into another building, one that seemed to be hanging over the river. The new apartment was like a movie set. The living room was covered with 40 feet of thick white carpet. The bar area was inlaid with Italian marble. There was a long staircase that obviously led to some upstairs rooms, but the breathtaking feature was the view. Glass doors opened onto the immense terrace that overlooked the river. He let her out. The cold wind blew the dampness in her face, but the beauty of the scene was overpowering. Bright lacework bridge lights looped the river. And tiny diamonds trickled across the spans. He, she stared, transfixed, not noticing Alan at all. Shall we drink to the new apartment, he asked. She came out of her reverie to accept an offered Coke. Alan, whose apartment is this? She said quietly. Mine, if I want it. But who does it belong to now? A man named Gino. But he says it's too big for him. He lives at the Waldorf, likes it better that way. But Alan, you can't afford anything like this. You'd be surprised at what I can afford. He was wearing the strange smile again. She started back inside. Alan, I think I had better go. I'm very tired and very mixed up. And he called her aunt. I'm rich, Anne. Very, very rich. She stared at him silently, and suddenly she knew he was telling the truth. I love you, Anne. In the beginning, I just couldn't believe you were going with me all this time and didn't know. Know what? Who I am? Who are you? Oh, I'm still Alan Cooper. That's the only thing you don't know about me, my name. Only to you, it doesn't seem to ring any bells. You accepted me as an unsuccessful little insurance man. Salesman, he grinned. You don't know what it's done to me these past few weeks, hiding you out in inexpensive restaurants, watching you order the least expensive thing on the menu, knowing you were worried about my sales, and no one has ever really cared about me before. At first, I thought it was a gag that you knew and were coming, were conning me. Oh, it's been tried before. That's why I asked so many questions, where you came from, all about Lawrenceville. Then I had a detective make a check. He saw her eyes narrow and grabbed her hands. And don't be angry. You were too perfect to be true. Gina couldn't believe it. But when the reports came in, when it all turned out to be on the level, the family home, the widowed mother, the aunt, and your good New, your New England background, you're a class, and real class, Jesus. When I found out, I wanted to send off rockets. I'd been so sure nothing like this could ever happen to me, that someone I worship could like me for myself. Can't you see that mean, what that means to me? He danced her around the room. You care, you really care, not for what I have, but for me. She broke away from him and caught her breath. Alan. How would I know who you were or about any of this unless you told me? I don't know how you couldn't know. I was always in the columns. I figured one of your girlfriends would tell you or certainly Mr. Henry Bellamy. 
I don't read the columns, and I have no girlfriends except Neely. She only reads Variety, and I never discuss my personal affairs with Mr. Bellamy or anyone else at the office. Well, now you can give them a big piece of news about us. He took her in his arms and kissed her. She stood there limply, then abruptly broke the embrace. God, it happened again. At his kiss, a surge of revulsion had swept through her. He looked at her tenderly. My sweet little Anne, I know you must be confused. She walked to the mirror and repaired her lipstick. Her hand was trembling. Something was wrong with her. Why should she feel this cold distaste for a man at a man's kiss? Many girls enjoyed kissing men they don't love. It was supposed to be normal, and she liked Alan. He wasn't a stranger, so it wasn't just Willie Henderson or the boys in Lawrenceville. The trouble must lie within herself. He stood behind her. I love you, Anne. I realize this has come fast. It's enough to confuse anyone, but I want to marry you, and I want you to meet Gina, my father. He handed her a key. Give this to Liam Burke tomorrow. Tell him to get in touch with me at my office. I'll have the lease switched immediately. And, and if this apartment is too overdone for you, you can throw everything out, redo it. Gina spent a fortune on it, but somehow I guess it doesn't look like you. Or if you like, we can buy a townhouse, anything you want. Alan, I, we've talked enough for one night. I love you, and you're going to marry me. Just hold that in mind for now. She was deep in her own thoughts as they drove home. She knew the truth now. She was frigid. That awful word the, word the girls at school used to whisper about. Some girls were born that way. They never reached a climax or felt any passion. And she was one of them. God, she couldn't even enjoy a kiss. Maybe she was lucky she had found someone like Alan. He was kind. He might even be able to help her. She might as well marry him. Her mother had been right. That great feeling, it didn't happen to a lady who felt revulsion at a kiss. But at least she had escaped Willie Henderson in Lawrenceville. Some people never even have half a dream come true. He held the cab when they reached her brownstone. Try to dream of me, Anne. He leaned over and kissed her lightly on the cheek. Good night. She watched the cab disappear, then she ran inside and banged on Neely's door. Neely appeared, her head bent over, gone with the wind, without putting the book down. She motioned Anne in and continued to read. Neely, put that book away for a minute. This is important. I wouldn't leave Rhett Butler right now for anything in the world. Neely, have you ever heard of Alan Cooper? Hey, what is this, a gag? I've never been more serious. Who is Alan Cooper? Does the name mean anything to you? Neely yawned and closed the book carefully, turning the corner of the page to hold Rhett in place. All right, if you want to play games, Alan Cooper is a very nice boy who dates you three or four nights a week. From what I've seen of him from my window, I'd say he wasn't exactly Cary Grant, but he's reliable. Now, can I go back to Rhett? He's lots more interesting, and Scarlett doesn't seem to appreciate him at all. Then you've never heard of Alan Cooper? No, should I? Has he been in pictures or something? I know about Gary Cooper and Jackie Cooper, but Alan Cooper, she shrugged. All right, go back to Rep Butler, and started for the door. You're acting funny tonight, Neely muttered. Hey, you don't have a drink or something, did you? No, see you tomorrow. Neely nodded absently. She was already back with Rhett and Scarlet in the darkness, and Anne lay awake sorting the facts. Alan was not a poor little insurance agent. Alan was rich. But why should she have heard about him? Was there something else she should know? How could she find out more about him? George Bellows, of course. If there was anything to know about Alan or anyone, George Bellows would know. George Bellows looked up in surprise when she entered his office. Hey, aren't you supposed to be out apartment hunting? May I talk to you, George? It's personal. He crossed the room and closed the door. Anytime. Sit down and make it as personal as you like. Here, how about some coffee? He poured her a cup from a thermos. All right, now, let's have it. Something bothering you? She studied the coffee. George, do you know Alan Cooper? Who doesn't? He looked at her carefully. Hey, don't tell me you've gotten involved with him. 
I know him. I understand he's quite rich. Rich? He chuckled unpleasantly. Baby, they have to invent a new word for this kind of money. Of course, his father, Gino, started the empire. They own half the real estate in this town. They're rumored to be partners with those millionaire Greek sh shipping tycoons. Time Magazine did a piece on Gino a few years ago. Maybe I can dig up a back copy in the library for you. They said his wealth couldn't even be estimated. They ran Alan's picture too, sole heir to the entire empire. You can imagine what an ad like this for the pair of them. Ever since they've needed elephant guns to keep the girls away. So if you've met Alan, I give you one piece of advice. Don't take him seriously. He's a louse. He seems very nice, she insisted. George laughed. Oh, he's smoother than glass, but I think he's as tough as his father underneath. He's put over some pretty shrewd deals on his own, managed to stay out of the army by buying some plant that made parachutes, I believe. She stood up. Thanks, George. Anytime, honey. I give you a rundown on every wolf in town. With your looks, you're bound to meet them all. Henry Bellamy's face sagged with disappointment when he saw her. Now, don't tell me you've given up already. Look, Anne, I know it's tough. I called a few renting agents myself today, but you've got to keep trying. I have the apartment for Mr. Burke. No, good God, you are uh, you are sensational, he buzzed Leanne's office and called him in. I have the key, she said. Mr. Burke can look at, look at it this afternoon. What's wrong with this morning, Leanne said as, she walked in, as he walked in. Can't give them a chance to change their minds, Anne. You're a one, uh, you are a wonder. What's the address? He, sc he scribbled it down. Great location. Can I afford it? It's 150 a month. He shook his head. You're a wizard. But why the key? Is the tenant away? No, he's probably at his office. What's the name? Alan Cooper, she said quietly. Leanne merely wrote down the name, but Henry looked at her curiously. How did you find this apartment, Anne? Through an ad? No, Alan Cooper is a friend of mine. Henry's expression relaxed. If he's a friend of yours, he can't be the Alan Cooper I know. I met him in this office, Mr. Bellamy. Here, Henry seemed puzzled. By God, you did. He rose with such violence that the chair banged against the wall. And you and Alan Cooper? No. He shook his head in disbelief. I thought he was just an insurance salesman when I met him, she said. That son of a bitch was here trying to get a chorus girl off his back. One of our minor clients wanted me to pay her off and throw a scar into her, a scare into her. I threw him out pretty quickly. He shot Anne an angry scowl, but obviously not quick enough. Henry, Leon's voice was sharp. Anne is certainly capable of choosing her own friends. Then with a quick smile at the older man, he added, you're not being very fair. You send Anne out on an impossible assignment, and when she delivers, instead of shouting her praises, you fire accusations and pry into her personal life. Alan Cooper, Henry repeated the name in disbelief. Leon, if you knew this Alan Cooper, Leon smiled. I don't want to know him. I just want his apartment. Have you ever heard of him? And Henry asked. Leon looked thoughtful. Seems I have. He's frightfully rich, I believe, but one shouldn't hold that against him. But Anne's no match. Against a guy like that, she doesn't play in her league. She's got to get killed, Henry insisted. She stood there quietly, slightly in the way that they were talking about her as if she weren't there. Okay, Henry turned and retrieved his chair. It's none of my business. Just as long as I go on record how I feel, from now on it's your ball game. And I'm sure she knows the rules, Leon said. He turned to her and smiled. I like very much to look at the apartment. Mine, if Anne goes with me, Henry. Henry waved his hand in dismissal and returned to his work. Anne heard him sigh heavily, and they left the office. She fastened, fastened her attention on the taxi window as they drove across town. It was one of those last wonderful days in October when the air, air is balmy and the faded sun tries to pretend it's spring. Don't be angry, Leon said quietly. Henry only blew off because he's fond of you in the nicest possible way. He doesn't want you to get hurt. 
I'm not angry, just confused. Since everyone seems to be offering unsolicited advice, let me add some of my own. Never judge anyone by another's opinions. We all have different sides that we show to different people. She, she smiled. You mean that even Hitler could be soft and playful with Ava Braun? Uh, something like that. And King Henry didn't kill all of his wives. If I recall correctly, the last one actually henpecked him. But Alan is really very nice, she insisted. I'm sure he is. And if this is his building, it's quite impressive. The cab stopped. A different doorman was on duty. We've come to see Mr. Cooper's apartment, Anne said. He nodded. Mr. Cooper told me about it. Tenth floor. She handed Leanne the key. I'll wait in the lobby. What? No guided tour? Come, my girl. I expect you to point out all the advantages of the flat. Where the linens are stored, how to work the stove where the fuse box is. She felt herself blushing. I wasn't there only once to look at the apartment for you. Then you still know more about it than I, he said easily. He liked everything about the apartment. He even insisted he liked the view of the fat man across the way. Makes it rather neighborly. I shall call Alan Cooper this afternoon and thank him, but first I must express my gratitude to you. I, su I suggest we both have a very expensive lunch on Henry. They went to the bar Barbary Room. She liked the soft blue darkness, the tiny artificial stars twinkling in the ceiling, and the generous armchairs. She accepted Sherry. In the last 24 hours, too many things had happened so fast, she felt unnerved and strangely off balance. Leon didn't pressure into conversation. He talked on easily about the marvels of the new apartment, the luxury of civilian food, his new appreciation of civilian life. Gradually, she felt herself unwinding. She liked his clipped accent, the soothing atmosphere of the room. She liked watching his face, his changes of expression, his quick smile. You have to bear with Henry's meddling in your life, he said as, she, as he leaned across to light her cigarette. But it's only because he wants the best for you. He's placed you on a bit of a pedestal. You're the one he's put on a pedestal, she said. One about 70 feet high. You're the future of Bellamy and Bellows. He felt the way for he felt that way four years ago, Leon said. People change in four years. Mr. Bellamy hadn't changed his opinion of you. He took her hand and can't we cut this Mr. business? I'm Leon. Mr. Bellamy is Henry. She smiled. All right, Leon. You must know how anxiously Henry has been waiting for you to come back. She stopped suddenly. This was none of her business. She had never intruded in anyone's personal life before. She felt an urgency to protect Henry. She suddenly understood Henry's stand against Alan. It was part of being a friend. She also saw the logic behind Neely's argument with new clarity. You couldn't be a real friend and remain politely impersonal. She would speak to Henry about Neely and hit the sky. She felt a new freedom as if she had shed another shackle that bound her to Lawrenceville. I'm aware of Henry of Henry's hopes and plans, Leanne answered, and perhaps I won't let him down, but God, it's a bastard business at best, neither lawyer nor agent, but everyone said you were a dynamo. You have to love something to give it such energy. I loved a good fight, the challenge, even the wheeling and dealing. She was confused. Everything he said contradicted the reputation that had preceded him. He took her silence as concern for Henry. Now don't fret, I'll probably just have a touch of battle fatigue, but you are glad to be back with Henry. I am back, uh, am I not? She looked puzzled. You say it as if there was really something else you'd rather do. Does anyone actually have the luxury of doing exactly what he wants to do? I'm doing what I want to do. He flashed a smile and flattered. I mean, working for Henry, living in New York, but what do you want to do, Leon? He stretched on his stretched his long legs under the table, be dreadfully rich for one thing, sit in some lovely spot in Jamaica, have several beautiful girls who look exactly like you to look after me and knock out the a best selling novel about the war you want to write. Of course, he shrugged, doesn't everyone who comes out of the army feel positive he has the only true war novel in him? Then why not write it? For one thing, working for Henry is a full-time proposition, and that charming flat I'm inheriting does not come rent-free. I'm afraid literature's lost will will be Henry Bellamy's gain. 
she realized Lee and Bert could not be categorized and neatly filed away. He had feelings, but he would always mask them with a smile or a contradictory statement. It's odd, but you don't strike me as a quitter, she said boldly. His eyes narrowed. I beg your pardon. Giving up without even trying, I mean, if you want to write, if you honestly feel you have something to say, then you do it. Everyone should at least try to do the thing he wants to do later in life. Situations and responsibilities force people to compromise. But to compromise now, it's like quitting before you start. He leaned ac across and cupped her chin in his hand. Their eyes met and he looked at her intently. Henry certainly doesn't know you. You can't be the girl he's been talking about. So far, the only thing he's been right about is your incredible beauty. By God, you're a fighter. You are. She sat back in her chair. This isn't really me today. She felt drained. I'm kind of off balance. Things have happened too quickly and we're noting and where nothing has ever happened to you for 20 years. I guess you do exactly. Uh, you do act strange. I mean, all this about Alan Cooper. I didn't even know who he really was until last night. Don't let Henry's opinion bother you. He's not exactly eager to break in some new, uh, someone new. He'll fight off your suitors with the hand grenades if necessary. Alan is just a friend. That's excellent news. This time, he looked at her without smiling. She felt flustered to cover her embarrassment. She said, what I said before about people trying to do the thing they really want to do, I mean that it, I did it when I came to New York. No one should give up a dream without having given it a chance to come true. I have no dreams, and I never had. This idea of writing just came to me after the war. Before the war, I was dedicated to success and making a pile of money. But now I'm not even sure I want that anymore. In fact, I'm not sure there's anything I particularly want. Then with one of his quick changes of mood, he smiled. Yes, there's one thing I do want. I want to be aware of the minutes and seconds and to make each one count. I can understand that, she said. It's a natural feeling for anyone who's been in the war. Oh, I don't be, uh, I was beginning to wonder if any females over here recalled there was a war. Oh, I'm sure everyone felt the war. I can't agree. When you're over there in it, you don't think there's anything else in life. You can't believe that someone, that somewhere people are sleeping in comfortable beds or sitting in a restaurant like this. It's different in Europe. Everywhere you walk, you see a bombed out building. You live with the constant reminder. But when I come back here, all the death and bloodshed seem so remote. It seemed that it couldn't have actually happened, that it was some hellish nightmare. There was New York. The Paramount building was still standing, its clock running just as it had always had. The pavements and the same cracks and the same pigeons or their relatives were messing up the plaza. The same lines were standing outside the Copa, waiting to see the same stars. Last night I was out with a beautiful creature who spent hours telling me about the hardships she had endured during the war. No nylons, plastic lipstick containers, no bobby pins. It was awful. I think the shortage of nylons affected her the most. She was a model and her legs were important to her. She said she was terribly glad we finally discovered the atom bomb. She had been down to her last six pair when, she, when it hit. I suppose if you're in it, nothing matters but getting out alive, she said quietly. You don't chance thinking even that far ahead, he answered. You think from day to day. If you allow yourself to think of the future, any personal future, you lose your nerve. And suddenly you recall all the, seamless, all the senseless time-wasting things you've done. The wasted minutes you'll never recover. And you realize that time is the most precious thing because time is life. It's the only thing you can never get back. You can lose a girl and perhaps win her back or find another, but a second, this second, when it goes, it's irrevocably gone. His voice was soft, remembering, and she noticed the fine lines around the corner of his eyes. There was this corporal. We were spending the night in what was left of a barn. Neither of us was sleepy. The corporal kept sifting some of the earth through his hand. He kept saying, this is great earth. Seems he had a farm in Pennsylvania. 
He began telling me the trouble he had with his peach trees and about the plans for enlarging the farm when he returned. He wanted it to be a good farm for his children when they grow up. But the soil bothered him. It wasn't rich enough. That's all he talked about. Soon I found myself worrying about his miserable soil, even offering suggestions. I think I fell asleep dreaming of fertilizers and acres and acres of peach trees. The next day was a bad one. We ran into landlines, snipers. The weather was foul. That night I made the reports on the missing men. I checked the dog tags. One of them was the corporal. I sat and stared at the dog tag. The last night it had been a man, a man who wasted his last night on earth worrying about fertilizer and soil, and now his blood would fertilize some foreign soil. He looked at her and suddenly smiled, and here I am wasting your time talking about it. No, please, go on. He looked at her strangely. I've said a great many things today, things that probably should have stayed locked away in my mind. He signaled for the check, but I've taken up enough of your time, maybe the rest of the afternoon. Make the rest of the afternoon count. Buy a new dress, have your hair done, or do anything, any of the wonderful things a beautiful girl should do. This girl's going back to the office. Nothing of the kind. I'm giving this order. Henry expected you to be gone several days. The least you deserve is a half a day holiday and a two week salary bonus. I'll see to that. But I couldn't think of a nonsense. I expected to hand a renting agent a full month's rent under the table. Let's call this my first official act at Bellamy and Bellows. You get a two week salary bonus and the afternoon off. She took the afternoon off, but she didn't do any of the things he suggested. She walked up Fifth Avenue. She looked at the new winter styles. She sat at the square at the plaza, and she thought about Leon Burke. He dwarfed it anyone she had ever known. She had been overwhelmed by the smiling, inscrutable Leon. But the Leon who talked about the war, he seemed accessible, capable of caring. He had cared about the corporal. Who was Leon Burke, really? She left the square and walked down Fifth Avenue. It was getting late. She had to go home and change. Alan was picking her up. Alan. She couldn't marry Alan. That wouldn't, that would be refuting everything she had said. That was really giving up. It was too early to compromise with even part of a dream. She would tell him at dinner, but it had to be brought up gently with tact. She couldn't just open with, hello, Alan, I'm going, I'm not going to marry you. But during dinner, she worked into it and break it easily, but firmly. It was as simple as that, but it wasn't. No quiet little French restaurant now. Alan no longer needed to hide his identity. They went to 21. Waiters bowed to him and everyone called him by name. He seemed to know most of the people in the room. By the way, Alan, do you like country living? He asked suddenly. And do you like country living? He asked suddenly. We have this house in Greenwich. This was the opening. No, I had enough of that in Lawrenceville. As a matter of fact, Alan, there's something I want to say, something you've got to understand. He looked at his watch and suddenly signaled for the check. Alan, go on, I'm listening. He was signing the check. It's about what you said last night and now about country living. Alan, I like you very much. Oh, I'm glad you reminded me. I sent the lease over to Lee and Burke, talked to him this afternoon. He sounds like a nice guy, English, isn't he? He was raised in England, Alan, listen to me. He stood up. You can tell me in the cab, please sit down. I'd rather tell you, I'd rather tell you here. He smiled and held her coat. It's dark in the cab, more romantic. Besides, we're late. She stood up helplessly. Where are we going? Morocco. He tipped his way out of the room with a series of surreptitious handshakes. In the, in the cab, he settled back and smiled. My father is in Morocco. I told him we would stop by. Now what did you want to tell me? Alan, I'm very flattered about the way you feel. I'm also grateful about the apartment for Leon Burke. It saved me a lot of trouble in pavement pounding. I think you're one of the nicest people I've ever met, but she saw the neon sign in El Morocco and her words rushed out. But about marriage, what you said last night, 
I'm sorry, Alan. I, good evening, Mr. Cooper, the doorman at El Morocco, sang the, sang the greeting as he swung open the door of the cab. Your father is inside. Thanks, Pete. Another bill exchanged hands. Alan led her into the club. She had failed to make her point, or had Alan consciously made it a point not to understand. Gino Cooper was sitting with a group of men at a large round table near the bar. He waved at Alan, signaling him to join them. The waiter led Alan to a table against the wall. It was 10.30, still early for El Morocco, although this was Anne's first visit to the famous club. She had seen pictures in newspapers and magazines of various celebrities sitting against the famous zebra stripes. She looked around. There were plenty of zebra stripes, but otherwise it was just a large room with a fairly good orchestra playing some show tunes. Gina joined their table immediately without waiting for any introduction. He grabbed Anne's hand and pumped it violently. So this is her, huh? He whistled softly, kid. You were right. This one was worth waiting for. She got real class. I can tell without even opening her mouth. He snapped his fingers. A captain seemed to materialize from the atmosphere. Bring some champagne, he ordered, without taking his eyes away from Anne. Anne doesn't drink, Alan began. Tonight she'll drink, Gina said heartily. Tonight it's an occasion. Anne smiled. Gina's warmth was infectious. He was swarthy, heavy set, and floridly handsome. His black hair was streaked with gray, but his immense vitality and enthusiasm were almost boyish. When the champagne was poured, he toasted her to the new lady in our family. With one gulp, he drained half his glass. He wiped his mouth on the back of his hand and said, are you Catholic? No, I, um, Anne began. Well, you got to convert when you marry Alan. I'll make an appointment with Father Kelly at the Paulus Center. He can rush it through with private instruction. Mr. Cooper, it had been almost a physical effort to find her voice. Alan quickly interrupted. We haven't discussed religion, Dad, and there's no reason for Anne to convert. Gina considered this. Well, not, not if she's dead set against it. Long as she marries in the church and promises to raise the kids Catholic. Mr. Cooper, I'm not going to marry Alan. There, she had said it loud and clear. His eyes narrowed. Why? You that anti-Catholic? I'm not anti-anything. Then what's the hitch? I'm not in love with Alan. At first, Gino's stare was blank. Then he turned to Alan in bewilderment. What in the hell did she say? She said she wasn't in love with me, Alan answered. Say, is this a gag or something? I thought you said you were going to marry her. I did, and I will, but first I have to make her love me. Are you both crazy or something, Gino demanded. Alan smiled pleasantly. I told you, Dad. Up until last night, Anne thought I was just a struggling little insurance agent. She has to readjust her thinking. What's to readjust, Gino asked, since when did money become a handicap? We never discussed love, Dad. I don't think Anne allowed herself to take me seriously. She spent too much time worrying I'd lose my job. Gino looked at Anne curiously. You really went with him all these weeks and ate all those hash houses he told me about? Anne smiled faintly. She was beginning to feel conspicuous. Gina's voice carried, and Anne was sure half the room was enjoying their conversation. Gino hit his thigh and laughed out loud. This is a good one. He poured himself more champagne and waiter. Up to assist him, Gino motioned him away. I used to open these bottles with my teeth. Now six flunkies feel they got to help me pour it. He turned to Anne. I like you. Welcome to the family. But I'm not going to marry Alan. He waved his hand in dismissal. Listen. If you've lived through six weeks of bad eats and accepted him as a punk, you'll love him now. Drink your champagne. Start cultivating rich taste. You can afford it. Hi, Roddy. A thin young man had appeared from nowhere and was standing silently at their table. This is Ronnie Wolf, Gina told her. Sit down, Ronnie. Gina snapped his fingers and called into space. Bring Mr. Wolf the, his usual. And from space, a waiter appeared and placed a pot of hot coffee before the stranger. Now, don't tell me you've never heard of Ronnie. Everyone reads his column, Gina said proudly. <laughs> Anne's new in New York, Alan said quickly. She only knows about the times. Good paper, Ronnie said crisply. He pulled out a worn little black leather book. His dark eyes darted from Alan to Gina. 
All right, let's have her name and who, sh who staked the claim, father or son. Both of us this time, Chino said. The little girl is going to be related to me soon. And well, spell the right, spell the name right, Ronnie. She's going to marry Alan. Ronnie whistled. He looked at Anne with curious respect. Big story, all right. New model in town, last as big prize or actress. Now, don't tell me if, if uh, see if I can guess. Texas? I'm from Massachusetts, and I work in an office, Anne said coldly. Ronnie's eyes twinkled. Next thing I expect you'll even tell me you can type. I, I hardly think that's news for your column, and I also think you should know that Alan and I... Now, Anne, Gina said quickly, Ronnie's a friend. No, let her go on. Ronnie was looking at her with something close to respect. Uh, have some more champagne, Gina said, refilling her glass. She picked up her glass, sipped it, in an effort to control her anger. She wanted to insist she was not marrying Alan, but she knew Gina had deliberately stopped her and probably would again. It would be embarrassing to him to be contradicted in public. The moment Ronnie Wolf left, she would tell Gina not to make any more statements. She had told them both, father and son, that she was not going to marry Alan. Did money give people a blind spot? Rob them of their bear of their hearing? How do you work? Uh, who do you work for? Ronnie asked. Henry Bellamy. Alan said, but that's temporary. Alan. She turned to him angrily, but Ronnie interrupted. Look, Miss Wells' questions are my job. He smiled in a frank and friendly way. I like you. It's refreshing to run into a little girl who didn't come to New York to be an actress or a model. He looked at her closely. Great cheekbones. You could make a fortune if you wanted. If Powers or Longworth ever saw you, you might even get rich than, richer than your boyfriend, he winked at Gina. If she wanted to work, we'd buy her a modeling agency, Gina bellowed. But she's going to settle down and raise babies. Mr. Cooper, Anne's face was burning. Alan broke in, Dad, let's take first things first. Ronnie laughed. Here comes your friend, Gina. Does, he, does she know the news? They looked up as a tall, stunning girl approached the table without rising. Gina moved over and patted the seat. This is Adele Martin. Sit down, baby. Say hello to Ann Wells, my son's fiance. Adele's penciled brow shot into a higher arch without acknowledging Anne. She looked from Alan to Ronnie for verification. Ronnie nodded, his eyes bright with amusement and Adele's consternation, but the girl's recovery was quick. She snuggled beside Gino and offered Anne a weak smile. How'd you swing it, honey? I've been trying to drag this baboon to the altar for seven months. Give me the magic word and we can make it a double ceremony. She looked at Gina adoringly. You're a career girl, Adele, Ronnie said, winking at Gina. Adele stared at him murderously. Listen, Ronnie, it takes a certain amount of talent to be a showgirl. Don't knock it. Ronnie smiled and tucked his notebook away. I think you're the best showgirl in town, Adele. You can say any. You can say that again, she said, somehow, somewhat mollified. I've turned down two movie offers to stay with a baby here. She leaned over and kissed Gina's cheek. Ronnie rose and jerked his head in farewell. Anne watched him join another table as another waiter swiftly appeared with fresh pot of coffee. Ronnie sipped the coffee slowly and took out his black book, his eager eyes constantly darting to the door to scan each new arrival. Alan followed her glance. Ronnie's a nice guy, no leg man. Gets all his own items, Adele sneered. His, he's a busybody. You're just mad because he's printed we're engaged to be engaged, Gino said. Well, it's a hell of a line. Maybe made me look like a fool. Then she smiled. How about it, baby? You can't let your son beat you to the altar. I've been to the altar, Gino said. After Rosanna died, that was the end of my married life. A guy can only have one wife. Romance is plenty, but one wife. Who made that rule, Adele demanded. Gina poured the girls some champagne and since that they had covered this ground many times. Adele, forget it. His voice was cold. Even if I did remarry, it couldn't be you. You've been divorced. Then, as Adele sulked, he said, oh, by the way, 
I told Irving to bring two coats to your place tomorrow. Take your pick. Adele's expression changed instantly. Both mink? What else? Maybe muskrat? Oh, Gina, she snuggled close to him. Sometimes you get me so mad, but I have to forgive you. I love you so much. Gina looked down at Anne's silk coat lying crushed on the seat. Hey, Alan. Okay with you if I send one over to Anne as an engagement present? present. Then without waiting for an answer, he turned to Anne. What color do you like? Color? Anne had always thought Mink's, Mink was brown. He means ranch or wild or honey. Adele explained, I think wild mink would go great with your hair. I'm afraid I couldn't accept it, Anne said quietly. Why not, Gina snapped. Perhaps Anne would like her coat to come from me after we're married, Alan said quickly. Gina laughed. You mean when you get your mink, you, went, you want it to be legal? What's illegal about taking a mink coat, Adele asked. I think it's illegal to turn one down. Anne felt uncomfortable, and the champagne made her feel warm. The club was packed. The dance floor had shrunk as waiters frantically paced, uh, placed dime-sized tables on the floor for important new arrivals. People were mashed against the velvet rope, and there wasn't an inch of space on the side of the room where they were sitting. Yet, curiously enough, there were some empty tables on the other side. Alan explained that that was the Siberia. If you sat on that side of the room, no one was it, no one respected you. Squares and out-of-towners sat there. They didn't know the difference, but a regular would die of embarrassment if he had to sit there. There was a constant swirl of people, a continuous flow of introductions. At some point, another columnist joined them briefly, and some took their picture. Gina ordered more champagne. Girls who looked like exact replicas of Adele stopped by the table and congratulated Alan and tossed sympathetic winks at Adele. Some greeted Alan with familiarity, a hug and a kiss, explosive declarations of eternal devotion, or did Anne realize how lucky she was, stares of envy and curiosity? She sat quietly, her outward calm denying her momenting, uh, mounting panic. She had to straighten this out with Alan on the way home. Then he could call Ronnie Wolf and the other columnists. She had to make him understand. She tapped his arm quietly. It's one o'clock, Alan. I should be getting home. Gina looked amazed. Home? That's a dirty word. The party's just getting going. I have to work tomorrow, Mr. Cooper. Gina smiled expansively. Little lady, you don't ever have to do anything again except be good to my boy. But I have a job. So quit it, Gina said, pouring champagne all around. Quit my job? Why not? This time it was Adele Martin who asked the question. If Gino asked me to marry him, I'd give up my career in a second. What career? Gino laughed, standing around as a backdrop. Two hours every night, he turned to Anne. Miss America here has to show up for work. She belongs to some kind of actor's union, but you got no contract. I like my job, and I wouldn't walk out on anyone, Anne replied. Gina shrugged. Okay, I go along with that, but you've got class. A guy should get noticed. Tell him tomorrow. Give him a chance to find someone else. He signaled for the check. Guess we could all stand one early night for a change. Anne slipped into her coat. She'd straighten this out when she got Alan alone in the cab going home. But there was no cab. A long black chauffeur car was waiting. Gina motioned them inside. Get in, he said. We'll drop Tilly, the top, top toilet, first. When they reached her brownstone, Gina, Gino and Adele waited in the car, and Alan walked her to the door. Alan, she whispered, I've got to talk to you. He leaned over and kissed her lightly. Anne, I know tonight it's been wild, but it won't be like that, like this again. You had to meet Gina. That's over and done with. Tomorrow we'll go out alone. I like Gino, but Alan, you've got to tell him. Tell him what? Alan, I'm not marrying you. I never said I would. He stroked her hair lightly. I don't blame you for panicking. Tonight would scare anyone. But tomorrow, everything will be different. He took her face in his hands. And believe it or not, you are going to marry me. No, Alan. Anne, are you in love with someone else? No, but hey, that's enough for me. Just give me a chance. 
Hey, Gina, hey, Gina bellowed out the window. Cut the gab and kiss her good night. Alan leaned over and kissed her lightly. I'll pick you up at 7.30 tomorrow night. He turned and ran down the steps. She stood there shivering as the car rolled away. Well, she had tried. If Ronnie Wolf printed it, he'd have to retract it. She ran up the stairs to her room. There was a white envelope pasted on the door. The childlike printing said, wake me no matter what time you come in, urgently, Neely. She looked at her watch. It was two o'clock, but the urgent was underlined. She made her way slowly down the stairs and tapped lightly, half hoping Neely wouldn't hear her. She heard the bed creak, saw the silver, uh, sliver of light appear under the door. The door opened and Neely rubbed her eyes. Jeez, what time is it? It's late, but your note said urgent. Yeah, come in. Can it wait until tomorrow? I'm awfully tired too, Neely. I'm wide awake now and freezing, Neely balanced from one bare foot to the other on the cold floor. Anne followed her into the room and she bounced back into her bed and under the covers. She bounced up her knees and grinned. Well, guess what? Neely either told me or let me go to sleep. We got the show. Fine, now Neely, if you don't mind, I've got to, that's it, fine. And good night, the biggest thing that ever happened to me. We land, hit the sky, and you dismiss it. I'm thrilled for you, Anne said, trying to force some enthusiasm into her voice. It's just that this has been a terrible evening. Neely looked instantly concerned. What happened? Did Alan try to get fresh or something? No, he asked me to marry him. What's terrible about that? I don't want to marry him. Then tell him. I did, but he won't listen. Neely shrugged. Tell him again tomorrow, but it will be in a column. Neely looked at her strangely. Anne, you're acting funny again. Why on earth would any why on earth would any columnist print that you were marrying some jerk little insurance guy? Because that jerk insurance guy is a millionaire. When Neely finally understood, she was ecstatic. Anne, she leapt out of bed and danced around the room. Anne, you've made it. But Neely, I don't love Alan. With all that money, it will be easy to learn, Neely insisted, but I don't want to get married or give up my job. I'm on my own for the first time, and I'm not ready to give it up. I've only had two months of freedom. Freedom? You call this freedom? Neely shrieked, living in a hall bedroom, getting up at 7 and rushing to the office, eating lunch at a drugstore, maybe tagging along to 21 once in a while with Bellamy and some client, and freezing in that black silk coat. You want to stay free for this kind of gloriousness? Tomorrow is November 1st. Wait until January and February. Boy, it's gorgeous in New York in February. Nothing but black slush. And that's one little stinking radiator in your room. It's going to seem like a matchstick. What are you giving up? Just tell me. My identity, maybe my future, my whole life, giving up before it begins. Neely, nothing ever happened to anyone in my family. They married, had children, and that was it. I want things to happen for me. I want to feel things, too. But it's happened, Neely hollered. Only you hit the jackpot right away. Are you angry because you didn't have to slave away for years, wear $6 shoes and bargain basement clothes? And if you blow this, it won't happen again. Do you think when your board claim secretary, another millionaire, will suddenly appear on the scene and say, okay, Ann, time to get married, huh? I'm not especially looking for someone rich. That's not important, Neely sneered. You've never been poor, Neely. Let me put it this way. You're thrilled because you've landed, hit the sky. Suppose after a few weeks of rehearsal, someone like Alan came into your life and asked you to marry him and shut the show before it even opened, would you? Would I? But so fast I'd make your head spin. Look, let's say I've had real talent. And let's say someday I get a chance to prove it. If I work real hard for years, what will I wind up with? Money, position, respect? That's it. That's all there is. And it could take me years of hard work to get that. Alan's handing you the works on a silver platter. Anne couldn't believe her ears. Neely, with the scrubbing face, looking younger than 17 years, plant, <coughs> pinning everything down so cynically, she started for the door. She was tired to ar too tired to argue. Good night, Neely. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Talk nothing. You'll marry him. Maybe I'll come live with you if hit the sky bombs. <coughs> wow, what a blast.
So we'll stop there. That's page 51 of Valley of the Dolls. The next chapter says November the 1945. And we're reading Valley of the Dolls. Ah, ah. Wow. It gets very saucy. Very, very saucy. That is just fun. And we I had to order this. It came from a library all the way in um, Georgia. <laughs> so we don't have unlimited time to read it. I don't know if we have, if I have the privilege of renewing it if we get close and um, so we'll have to try to read through it quickly. I think I have to return it in a couple of weeks. So 50, page 51 of 500 pages. So we'll make as much progress as we can and hope for the best. But it is such a good read I didn't want to miss out. We'll pick up where we left off when we finish with this book and read the rest of Dolores. Here is my shout out is my lipstick. It is bubblegum pink. And it smells like bubblegum. Isn't that a blast? I got it at the Dollar Tree for $1.25. And then the other side has like a lip gloss with sparkles. And that smells like bubblegum too. It almost smells like you could eat it. I wouldn't eat it though. It probably wouldn't be edible. But that is my Shout out. And this is my product placement in honor of Valley of the Dolls. It is a bottle of pills. Dolls is the word they use for pills. But of course, consult your physician before ingesting any pills. These are just ibuprofen, but uh, you know, in the wrong hands, it might do damage. But this is in honor of Valley of the Dolls is the bottle of pills. It is Saturday and it's already almost noon. I wanted to get started earlier, but YouTube was not working, and I had been editing all morning. Since 3 o'clock this morning, I was editing a video. It turned out the way I wanted it to, but it just took freaking forever. <laughs> but it's done, and it's uploaded, so it'll come out later. You guys will see it later. It just took forever anyway. It's over. But I want you to have a good day. Let me know you were here. Leave me a comment and leave me something in the chat so I can set you as moderator and then I'll go back and look at your videos. So give me a kiss. Have a wonderful Saturday and I hope your team wins. I always cheer for the ball. I feel like I don't understand why every other second they put in a new ball and throw the old ball out. What do they do with all these balls? I had a ball game once and we used the same ball the whole game and used the same ball over and over again for years. I had a basketball that was so old it was smooth it no longer had the bumpy things on it, but it was still worked. I still played basketball with it. <laughs> so I'm cheering for the ball. Go ball. Yay team. Go team. Sports. Yay sports. <laughs> Who's here? I love. Hey. I'm so happy to see you, Juwan. I hope you have a wonderful day. And I will go back and watch your videos too. Okay. Have a good day. Happy Saturday.